SpaceX said on June 24 that it had postponed the next launch of a Falcon 9 rocket due to unspecified technical concerns. The mission, named Transporter 2, is SpaceX's second dedicated small satellite rideshare mission, following the launch of the Transporter 1 mission in January. The Transporter 1 mission delivered 143 small satellites to a sun-synchronous polar orbit, while Transporter 2 is expected to carry around 88 spacecraft into a similar orbit. The payloads include small satellites for the U.S. military, radar and optical Earth observation satellites for Satellogic and ICE, and numerous CubeSats for U.S. and international operators. The mission carries five satellites of the Space Development Agency, which include two pairs of satellites to demonstrate laser communications links. Mandrake 2, a pair of small spacecraft equipped with optical crosslinks, were made by Astro Digital with optical links from SA Photonics. Also on Transporter 2 are a pair of CubeSats built by General Atomics that will be used to demonstrate optical communications between satellites and from satellites to a military drone aircraft. The Falcon 9 first stage featured in this launch is one of SpaceX's veteran booster, dubbed B-1060, embarking on its eighth mission. The booster had previously carried five different Starlink Internet satellite payloads, an upgraded GPS satellite for the U.S. Space Force, and a communications satellite for Turkey. SpaceX is now targeting June 29 to launch the mission, which will mark SpaceX's 20th Falcon 9 launch of the year. SpaceX President and Chief Operating Officer Gwyn Shotwell has revealed that the company's low-Earth orbit Starlink satellite broadband may be operational by around September. Starlink, the satellite internet unit of Elon Musk's SpaceX, already has almost 100,000 users, with half a million people waiting to use the service. Starlink, which has said it plans to deploy 12,000 satellites in total at the cost of roughly $10 billion, currently offers beta services in 11 countries. This year, the U.S. Federal Communications Commission approved SpaceX's plan to deploy some Starlink satellites at a lower Earth orbit than planned to provide high-speed broadband internet services to people who currently lack access. According to Shotwell, Starlink will be able to offer continuous global coverage once all 1,800 satellites reach their operational orbit. However, the company still needs regulatory approval from any given country to be able to provide telecom services. NASA has stacked the next piece of the agency's first space launch system moon rocket, adding an adapter structure to connect the launch vehicle's core and upper stages. Ground crews inside the vehicle assembly building at the Kennedy Space Center connected the launch vehicle stage adapter on top of the SLS core stage on June 22, inside high bay number 3. The stage adapter is the structural interface between the SLS core stage with the rocket's interim cryogenic propulsion stage, or upper stage. The cone-shaped adapter has a height of 9 meters and tapers from the top of the 8.4-meter diameter core stage to the base of the 5.1-meter diameter upper stage. The adapter will also help protect the upper stage's RL-10 engine during the early minutes of the SLS launch before the engines fire to send an Orion capsule on a trajectory toward the moon. Before the stacking of the stage adapter last week, ground teams mounted the 65-meter SLS core stage between the rocket's twin solid-fueled boosters on June 13. The next step is to install the interim cryogenic propulsion stage, the hydrogen-fueled upper stage of the rocket. The upper stage has already delivered to the vehicle assembly building earlier this week. The stacking of that piece of the rocket is scheduled for sometime next week. Once the upper stage is mounted on top of the SLS, the team will conduct a series of ground tests before installing the Orion spacecraft, which has already been integrated with its launch abort system. Assuming no significant delays, the first SLS test flight will be launched soon as November. The mission, named Artemis 1, will send an unpiloted Orion crew capsule to orbit the moon and return to Earth. NASA's Ingenuity helicopter has completed its eighth flight on Mars on June 21. During the flight, the 1.8 kg Mars helicopter flew for 77.4 seconds and traveled 160 meters southeast to a new landing spot, about 133.5 meters from NASA's Perseverance rover. The robotic helicopter had a maximum ground speed of 4 meters per second during its eighth flight. Monday's flight came about two weeks after Ingenuity's previous flight on June 8. The success of the new flight marks a second flawless flight for the helicopter after a difficult sixth flight that tested the chopper's resilience. Although Ingenuity was initially designed to fly only five times, its steady successes encouraged the agency to extend its mission and experiment with more ambitious flights. The flights are scheduled to continue for at least a few more months, though NASA has not yet announced when the helicopter will make its ninth flight.
With the Ingenuity helicopter continuing to demonstrate its abilities on Mars, NASA engineers are examining concepts for a larger and more capable rotorcraft that could be flown on future missions. In a white paper submitted as part of the ongoing Planetary Science Decadal Survey, scientists described two conceptual Mars rotorcraft based on the design of Ingenuity. The paper proposes a coaxial helicopter design that has a total mass of 4.6 kilograms and a maximum science payload capacity of 1.3 kilograms. Individual flights range up to 10 kilometers laterally, and vertical climbs of 2 kilometers are possible. The second vehicle, a hexacopter, is larger and has a total mass of approximately 30 kilograms. The helicopter has a payload capacity of up to 5 kilograms, lateral traverses over 10 kilometers, and vertical profiles of more than 2 kilometers per flight. The paper concluded that a helicopter design should be considered in all future launch opportunities to Mars' surface. Last week, astronauts aboard the International Space Station conducted two spacewalks to install a pair of ISS rollout solar arrays delivered to the space station on a SpaceX Dragon 2 cargo spacecraft earlier this month. NASA astronaut Shane Kimbrough and ESA astronaut Thomas Peskett conducted a six-and-a-half-hour-long spacewalk on June 20 to install the first rollout solar array. In the eighth spacewalk of the year outside the station, the two astronauts completed the solar array deployment on the far end of the port site of the station's backbone truss structure. Previously during a spacewalk on June 16, Kimbrough and Peskett moved the first IROSA to a mounting bracket on the power channel on the port's six trusses, where it was secured in its folded configuration. On their June 20 spacewalk, the astronauts successfully unfolded the solar array, bolted it into place, and connected cables to the station's power supply to complete deployment. Five days later, on June 25, both the astronauts conducted their second spacewalk in a week. This time they successfully removed the second array from its position in the flight support equipment, maneuvered it into position, connected the electrical cables, and released it to extend the array to its fully deployed position. According to NASA, both new solar arrays are providing good power generation. Each new IROS array is expected to produce more than 20 kilowatts of electricity, increasing the station's total available power to a maximum of 215 kilowatts. NASA plans to launch two more pairs of solar arrays to the space station aboard SpaceX CRS-25 and CRS-26 missions. Now, let's discuss some of the major Starship updates from the past week. After successfully completing two cryogenic proof tests, Super Heavy Test Tank Booster BN 2.1 has moved back to the production facility on June 25. The cryoproof tests verified the weld and structural integrity of the tank, and engineers can implement what they learned to prepare the Super Heavy Booster prototypes for orbital flights. The hydraulic ram, which was used to simulate the thrust generated by the nine inner engines of the booster, was also transported back to the build site on Friday. Before discussing further updates, I think it's necessary to talk about Super Heavy Booster nomenclature to avoid confusion. Booster BN1, the manufacturing pathfinder which got scrapped on April 13, is now known as Booster 1. Booster BN2, which is under construction inside the high bay, is now retitled as Booster 3, replacing its former booster number designation. This is because the booster comprises parts taken from the cancelled Booster BN2 and parts previously labeled for Booster BN3. Moreover, the forthcoming booster will be called Booster 4. Keeping this in mind, let us discuss the latest Super Heavy updates. In his recent tweet, SpaceX CEO Elon Musk says that the Super Heavy Booster 3 is almost done and will be moved to test stand A for ground tests. The booster is now almost 65% complete, standing 42 meters tall. By simply averaging the time it's taken for SpaceX to stack Booster 3 to a height of 42 meters, the booster could reach its full height around three weeks from now. Once fully assembled, the prototype will be rolled out to the launch site, where it will undergo a series of ambient pressure tests, followed by cryogenic proof tests and a couple of static fire tests. Once these tests were successfully completed, the booster will be taken back to the build site for scrapping. In his tweet, Mr. Musk also revealed that the next booster prototype, Booster 4, will go orbital, but he didn't mention a date. Given that a lot of groundwork needs to be completed before the maiden orbital flight of Starship, we will have to wait a couple of months to witness that spectacular event. SpaceX needs to complete the assembly of orbital launch tower segments and install support structures before Starship's orbital flight test. Work on the orbital launch mount is pending, and work on the orbital launch table is in progress at the build site. Even though it's unclear how many ground support equipment tanks were needed to support the orbital test flight, surely a couple of them must be operational before the test flight. 
Currently, two GSE tanks and one water tank were installed at the launch site, and five tanks are under production at the build site. Considering these facts, I don't think the orbital launch will take place before September. Surprisingly, SpaceX President Gwyn Shotwell said on Friday that the company is shooting for July to launch the first orbital space flight of its Starship rocket. The announcement came during the National Space Society's Virtual International Space Development Conference, held on June 25th. So uh, we are headed for our first uh, orbital attempt in the not too distant future. Uh, we're shooting for July. Um, I'm hoping we make it. Even though she is optimistic about Musk's goal of launching Starship to orbit by July, it is highly unlikely that SpaceX will complete the groundworks, stack Booster 3, and finish its ground tests, stack Booster 4, and conduct its pre-flight test by the end of July. Moving on to other Starship updates, recently a drawworks hoist was delivered to the launch site and got installed onto the orbital launch tower basement. A drawworks is most commonly used in the drilling industry to raise and lower a traveling block. The drill line wire rope winds on the drawworks drum and over the crown block to the traveling block, allowing the drill string to be moved up and down as the drum turns. A supply reel supplies the drill line through the deadline anchor. Even though it's ambiguous why SpaceX needs oil rig machinery at the Starship factory, there are some possible answers. It can be part of the lifting mechanism that lifts and stacks Starship above the booster, or it can be part of the booster catching and lowering mechanism. Moreover, the giant pulley that was spotted near the Starship factory a few weeks ago could be part of the traveling block of the hoisting equipment. The equipment that got delivered to Starbase is an ADS-30Q drawworks, built by National Oil Well Barco. The machine is equipped with four motors, each having a rated output power of 1,150 horsepower. The machine includes two disc brakes with a diameter of 1.2 meters to act as a parking brake when no motion is desired. These brakes could be used to position the booster catching mechanism at the desired location, and later the brakes can be released to lower the booster. The machine can be powered by AC or DC, or connected directly to an internal combustion engine. The apparatus is equipped with gears for speed reduction and is capable of handling approximately 1,245 tons of load. The sixth prefabricated segment of the orbital launch tower got installed atop the fifth segment on Sunday. The tower is now 122 meters high. The seventh segment of the tower is already assembled and is waiting for rollout. A recent road closure notice published on the Cameron County website suggests that the rollout could happen as early as Monday, June 28. The eighth and final segment of the launch tower is being assembled at the build site. This segment is shorter than the previous segments and has connecting plates at the top for connection to a roof structure. Orbital launch mount work is in progress, and last week workers installed crossbeams connecting the launch mount legs. Currently, workers have installed four crossbeams, and two more beams will be added in the coming days. The suborbital launch pad A is now being upgraded ahead of hosting Super Heavy Booster 3 for ground tests. A part of the test stand of Booster BN 2.1 got installed into the suborbital pad on Saturday. A new array of Starlink Gateway ground stations arrived at Starbase last week. Ground stations are the linking factor between the satellites in space and the Internet data centers on Earth. These arrays will ensure secure high-speed data transmission between Starship and ground station during missions. SpaceX Starship Booster's hot gas thrusters made their first public appearance last week at the build site. The thrusters were seen attached to the forward ring of a booster prototype. Elon Musk has previously mentioned that SpaceX aims to have hot gas thrusters on booster for the first orbital flight. Until now, SpaceX has relied on cold gas thrusters filled with cryogenic liquid nitrogen for attitude control. Cold gas thrusters are too inefficient, and SpaceX's long-planned solution has been developing a bi-propellant thruster that uses the same methane and oxygen propellant used in Raptor engines. The use of hot gas thrusters avoids the need to carry additional propellants in their tanks. Such a thruster could offer around five times the efficiency and thrust of a similarly sized cold gas system. On Super Heavy, these thrusters can be used to efficiently maneuver the booster after stage separation to return to Earth. They can also be used for the precise alignment of the booster during its mid-air catch. In his recent tweet, Mr. Musk mentioned that these thrusters would be an unnecessary complication for now and are being removed to speed up time to Starship's first orbital launch. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.